and I think I think Anthony was like, we want you to infuse a little bit of like Yoda in the character. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> This Organized Chaos video is brought to you by GEMS Art Studio. GEMS Art Studio is an online store that allows access to prints that you can use for most anything, obviously as just a picture, or as a wallpaper, or as a bookmark, or anything you can think of. You can find GEMS Art Studio at etsy.com slash shop slash GEMS Art Studio. This video is also brought to you by viewers like you. Thank you. You know, in pretty much anything out there, Invincible, uh, Master of Impressions. Uh, so please give a warm welcome for Ross Merplon. I was going to do summer school every year, and I 
was going to double major to finish on time, and uh, I had to apply for an extra uh, grant or scholarship, rather, and I, I got the scholarship, thank God. So I was able to do both, but and, like satiate my parents, but at the same time, like really do what I wanted to do. And I'm so glad I did that. What do you think um, was your first like your first acting gig? Um, outside of after college, like you felt like, okay, I can do this. Uh, man, that's a great. I don't know. I mean, I think I, I got to LA in like 2005. I, I, I lived with my folks for about a year after I graduated because I was trying to save up money and I, everyone kept saying how expensive LA was. And it is. And I got there and I think I blew through my savings in like six months. I mean, it was just gone. And um, everything I'd been saving up for a year was just totally demolished. And then I was doing a lot of um, extra work. I actually, uh, I got my SAG card by being a body double for Brian Krause from Charmed. I don't know if you guys watch it, yeah. And yeah, yeah, and he's the coolest guy. Like I've, I've seen him at a bunch of conventions and I always joke that I was his body double for a while. And he's like, really? I never met you. I was like, yeah, because you were never there. Like, um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a crazy industry. I did extra work for a long time and did some clinics with movies. Uh, flags of our fathers and then you know kind of did a bunch of indies and I was like okay I think I'm getting the hang of this but it really wasn't until I got Mad Men I did one episode of Mad Men like 10 years ago I want to say that gave me um, the sense of like oh I guess I can do this you know because before that was all mostly student films or indie films and you know while some of them are better than others you're like well you have this idea in your head as an actor that until it's like this big project that everyone recognizes it's not you're not really like a real actor you know until you book that stuff which i think is unfortunate because you know some of that stuff that i did in those early days was i'm very proud of you know it just never saw the light of day because <laughs> it's very small, small products, you know? um so for man men do you think that propelled you right in well not right into it but did that propel you into walking dead um did that basically did that go from man men yeah, obviously you had other rules, but then was that the thing that got you noticed by The Walking Dead? I just... Um, well, no, I, I had auditioned for The Walking Dead prior to getting the Mad Men. Um, and I actually auditioned, the second time I auditioned was for the role of Gareth, the, the, the cannibal, in season five, or four, uh, four, four and five, yeah. I guess it, it bled over into the two seasons. But I was so bummed when I saw the part, I was like, ah, it's a great part, I wish I could have booked him, and then of course he gets killed after four episodes. I was like, oh, it's okay. But um, yeah, I, I really wanted to book that part. And then I, I gave up acting right before I got the third audition. Um, I was like six weeks away from moving to New York to pursue photography and, and art and writing and probably way more poor than I already was. But I was like, I'm done with acting. It's not going to happen for me. I just, I think it, I gave it 10 years. I have to be honest with myself and it's just not going to happen. And then uh, I got the third audition, and I had to be convinced by my manager you can go to the audition because I was like, no, I'm good. I'm, I don't want to do this anymore. And uh, I'm so glad she convinced me because that, you know, that, that day I, I auditioned, it was just one, one and done on camera. And uh, a week later on my birthday, I was sick as a dog. I had like this terrible stomach flu. And my manager called me and she's like, are you sitting down? I'm like, I'm lying down, what's going on? And, like, she, and she's like, well, you're just with the walking dead. I was like, oh my god, you know, so it was cool. Yeah, we are all like that. Do you have stress every week that you're going to get killed off in the series? I, I used to, and then Josh McDermott, Eugene, um, I kept telling him, I was like, oh, I thought they were going to kill me off. I just, hey, I have a feeling they're going to kill me. And, and he said, he gave me the best advice, and it was the best advice for the show, but also I think for real life. He said, do you think worrying about whether or not you're going to live or die is going to add any enjoyment to your time on the show? Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, no, probably not. He's like, there you go. I mean, just, 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 if they kill you, they kill you. You can't control that. And it's a good lesson for real life, too, because like, you don't know if you're going to live or die any day. It's good. Anything could happen to us, but you just have to enjoy the, the days that we have here because mm -hmm. nothing is guaranteed. It was a really like, that's a very sad thing to say, Josh. <laughs> like, it is, it's good, yeah. um, have you finished uh, filming for the last season? Uh, production is still happening for another six months. Okay. We, we started filming in January, and it wraps probably next March. Okay. Hopefully, as long as there's no crazy delays or anything. 
It's yeah. aliens, isn't it? It's so aliens. Know. I've been saying for years, it's Dude. definitely aliens. Did you guys ever watch uh, History Channel and the, the Ancient Aliens? Yeah. You know that guy with the Greek? Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I mean? That Greek guy, George Satukilios, I can't remember his name, but he's always like, aliens. <laughs> always, <laughs> always aliens. That's how I want the show to end. No explanation, just like, aliens pop up in Norway. Oh yeah, great. And I think Kirkman actually did that in one of his comic books. Oh, really? Yes. Um, it was because people kept saying, you better not be aliens. Oh. And one of his issues, he had an alien thing. It was a fake thing. But oh. he put it in an issue of like at the end. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I would love it. Who would show up hands? Who would like to see it end with aliens? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just like, what? There's, what? there's no real resolution that's going to be satisfying for anybody. We're going to be like, I don't know, I wish it had ended this way or this way. You know, um, I think aliens is the best way to go, you know, just make it weird. Just make it weird. I don't think you would have any outcry on the internet. No, I don't think so. No, no, I don't think I would love that. I think I'd be a point. Everyone on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very well behaved. Uh, and, and, and uh, oh, what was I going to say? The, um, there was one fan theory that was like, I think it's going to end with Rick coming out of his coma for real. And it was all a dream. And I was like, that would be the most unsatisfying ending of the show. Like, oh man, it was all a dream. Okay, cool. And his life's fine and everything's okay. That'd be a letdown, I think. But Can we quote you in the papers that it's going to end with aliens? Uh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's the last season. I don't care. <laughs> so, Eric, um, I loved Aaron in the comic books. Um, and in the show, it came, he seemed like he started as a scout and then kind of a general of the army in a ground battle. And now he's, especially recently, he's more of a community leader. Um, he's had tension with Maggie and everything. Can you kind of, uh, kind of just go over like how he's changed over the years and how it's, you know, zombies have basically changed to how he is? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's I think zombies, but also all the threats they've had. I mean, uh, you know, we, we, we first kind of saw the first threat for the Alexandrians with the Wolves in season five, then it was the Saviors, then it was the Whisperers, mm -hmm. and you know, there's a, I'm sure there's other threats that I'm not thinking of in between, but like, kind of, it's just been one thing after the next, you know. And uh, I, was, I was talking to someone about this the other day, of the original Alexandrians that were first introduced in season five, there's only three left. There's like a hundred people that we saw regularly on the show. Now it's me, Barbara, and Scott, and everyone else is dead. So like, I, you know, I, I do think it's interesting that as soon as Aaron brings Rick in the game to Alexandria, that's when everything starts falling apart. Um, and I think he's kind of stepped up in a big way because he has to, you know, Deanna died, Spencer died, all these other people that you know, were leaders there, they all died. And so um, whether, you know, he, he feels compelled to naturally or because he's just like, oh yeah, there's no one else to do this. Um, he's kind of become the de facto leader of Alexandria, and I think that's, that's great because it should be him because he was the, he was the OG, you know, so. It, it definitely seems like he's stepped into the nicer version of Rick uh, <laughs> with it because it seems like recently it's more Negan uh, and around in his own way. Maggie and Aaron are kind of taking over the whole community. Daryl and Carol are kind of like in their own side world right now. Um, is that, was there an outline throughout the whole series? Like from the writers, or was it just kind of, is a season to season progression? I don't know the answer to that, honestly. I mean, they, they basically, they give us the scripts about a week before we shoot it, and we're like, oh, okay, cool, that's what's happening. You know, so we, we try to have some input in, in the storyline, but uh, at the end of the day, it really just comes down to what the producers and writers want to do with the show. Yeah. Uh, did you have any say on your arm, what it looked like? You know, it's funny, they, uh, that was originally supposed to go to another character. I can't say who, but uh, that, that, that character didn't really want to do that for several reasons, uh, mostly practical. And um, when they told me that Angela said, you know, we're thinking about cutting your arm off, I was like, oh, okay. That's, that's cool. So I just thought I was going to be walking around with a green sock the rest of my days on the show. And she said, no, 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 we're going to give you a prosthetic. And, when I got the prosthetic, uh, Greg Gutero, who is our EP, he worked on Army of Darkness, and I think he made the hand that Bruce Campbell wore uh, in that. And when I got it, I was like, dude, is this 
basically the same mold from Army of Darkness. And it's funny because it has these uh, spots on the knuckles and right here that look like the Infinity Gauntlet. And I was like, this is the craziest crossover I've ever had this week. It's so funny that you carved it out so specifically to have like the Infinity Stones in there. Like, honestly, it's great. I hope one falls off the truck at the end of shooting because I definitely want to have that. I think you should, you know. Or they wanted. Yeah. Come on. I mean, I should have that. Yeah. <laughs> and also, like, uh, this arm came lower now than the other, than the right arm because of that. Because it's, it's like the, the the mace arm is like 15, 20 pounds of metal to metal. So, like, <laughs> it's just hanging my arm does hang twice lower than the right arm because of the trouble like that with the time. Yeah. You're of it. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've heard through the years that when a cast member is killed off, that you guys have a dinner? Is that correct? Yeah, they, they, they call them death dinners, which sounds so terrible. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we, we do. Which is, it's kind of a cool idea because I think, I think it, we should all start doing this because it's like uh, all your friends are gathered around and they say nice things about you, you know, before you die. You know, it's like you're giving a eulogy for the person that's actually there. I think that we should be doing that in real life because, you know, once once someone's dead, they don't hear all the nice things people want to say about you. You know, and it's you know, I think it'd be cool to have like pre-death funerals. You know, I don't know. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Like, would be kind of nice. I would say in the last two years probably would be good idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I obviously you work with all of them; they're all tough. But is there one actor or actress that? was like, you were just gutted that they weren't coming back? Oh, I mean, Sonequa, uh, I mean, that, 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 that hit me hard. It you know, really hit me hard because I, you know, I met, uh, met Lauren, who Maggie, of course, and, uh, and Sonequa and Sasha in the first episode. We just bonded really quickly, and she's like the sweetest person I think I've ever met. Um, so when she died, and also when, when Glenn and Abraham died, that was not fun. You know, your friends, you know, they're not just uh, they're not just coworkers. They're like people you hang out with, and, mm -hmm. and when you realize you're not going to see them as much, it's, it's a bummer, you know. Um, with you taking over the Red Skull now from Marvel, and that's one. Does Hugo Weaving still talk to you after that? <laughs> still talk to me. Uh, he never talked to me actually. <laughs> I've, never, I've never met Hugo. Oh, what was your second question? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, how did that come to, uh, how did you get that role as the Red Skull? Well, I don't know the exact details of why he didn't want to come back. Um, I, I know that they had reached out to him and they were kind of holding on hope that he was going to come back. But towards the end of production, this was like late 2017, they realized that he was going to decline and they reached out to a few actors who did impressions, you know, and um, they, they, they asked my manager, like, does Ross do a Hugo Weaving impression? And I said, I don't know which Hugo Weaving you're talking about, because the guy's like a master of accents. You know, he does his native Australian, obviously, very well. And he does British, and he does American, and Matrix. And they said, well, we're thinking like a German Hugo Weaving. I'm like, it's like, let's go. You know, and I'm like, well, we can't really say. And they, they, at that point, I didn't even know what the project was. They, they couldn't say what the project was actually going to be. They didn't say, oh, it's Avengers, and it's going to be War and Gang. Um, so I sent in uh, what I thought was going to be, you know, the, the Red Skull, and listened to that a bunch of times on YouTube, and sent in my audition. And like three weeks later, I was already back in LA, driving back to the airport on my lift. And uh, on the way home, I got the call, and they were like, "Hey, uh, you booked the part." I'm like, "What part? What are you talking about?" And now you really didn't know. And they're like, "Well, are you in Atlanta still?" And I said, "No, I just got back to LA." Like. You need to be in LA, Atlanta tomorrow, so go right back to the airport. And so I literally went right back. I told the lift driver, like, can you take me right back to the airport? And, and I booked the next flight out. And uh, by like, I think nine or 10 the next morning, I was doing the shoot. And I was like, where the hell am I? This is crazy. You know? I, I literally had no idea what it was until I got there. Yeah. How long did it take you to feel comfortable with that impression of Hugo Weaving? I still don't. I mean, I, 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 I feel like, because when I, when I first, I thought it was going to be just a straight voice match 
uh, and that was it. But when I got there, you know, the, 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 the typical Hugo from the first Avenger, where it's like this almost not nasally, but like higher pitch, like Captain America, there are no flags in the future. You know, this this sort of like you know, it's it's a little bit higher pitch. And when I got to the Russo brothers, were like no, 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 he's he's 84 years older. He's a broken man. Like he's not he's not well. You know, he's he's totally lost all of his ambition and and lust for life. You know, um, so he's just very like he's he's a he's a broken man. So they want. I think I think Anthony was like, we want you to infuse a little bit of like Yoda in the character. I'm like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Search for the soul stone, you must, yeah. Uh, but, but they're like, no, no, not, not with the voice, just like with the, with the character. Oh, okay. So that's when I made him, you know, it's, it's very wizard, you know, sort of like, it just became much more uh, subtle, I guess, than, than like what we had seen from, from you in the first adventure, which was great. Like, I, I love what you did in that movie. I thought he was wonderful, you know. So. I like how you made him Rex call sympathetic. <laughs> yeah, well, it kind of had to be because it, it, he's just—he's trapped on board here. You know, he's totally at the mercy of the Soul Stone. Like something happened when he picked up the Tesseract that launched him into space. And I guess I don't know the—I mean, I don't think it's ever been, been fully explained. But like, clearly, his soul fused with the, the Tesseract or something. He's kind of like a ghost, but he can float now. He can fly. I don't know. I mean, I don't even know if he's actually there or if he's just an apparition. I don't know, but. Uh, 
Jack Nicholson, okay, you'd like Jack. Now, which Jack would you like? Would you like the shining, indie, like that? Or do you want more of the older, like about Schmidt, where it's a little bit more subtle? Which would you like? I like the shining. Yeah. Shining is the I like the eyebrow. Everybody that does Jack Nicholson does the eyebrow. Every time. I was a pretty good uh, Jack Nicholson, too. Uh, not Harrison Ford now, but earlier. Could you do that? Oh you, yeah, why? Well, I, I think it's funny because I do Han Solo a bunch for different uh, video games and stuff, and I I, I do better with like mid '90s Harrison Ford. Uh, I can do like nowadays Harrison Ford too, but uh, it's so gruff, you know. But but the '70s, you know, uh, Harrison when he's doing uh, you know the first Star Wars, it's a little bit higher than that. It's up here. And I, I, I mostly work in the wheelhouse of like, you know, the fugitive and around that area. It was like, get off of my plane, you know, like, <laughs> I didn't kill my wife. I fought with a war man. You find this man. You know, that's like, that's, that's kind of <laughs> Now he just sounds like he's yelling at kids on his lawn. <laughs> <laughs> get off of my lawn. <laughs> And four just like yelling at kids all day, like, get, get off my lawn. Yeah, get off of this lawn. We, we just had that treated, okay? God, oh, come on. They're just angry old men. I would pay to watch that. They watch that. Should, it's just the Hollywood listen to it. Yeah. Two hours of them just yelling at kids. I think Cry Macho is like that. Cry <laughs> right, Macho. Yeah, that's the new one, Clean Eastwood. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. In the trailer, he yells at kids. That's what he's good at. Uh, last one, uh, John Hamm? Can you do John Hamm? Oh, John Hamm. Sure. I was, I usually people say John C. Riley. Uh, oh. John Hamm is, is very, you know, Mad Men, of course. You know, he just, he's very, uh, you know, presentational when he talks. He's just uh, like that. But, but I like doing John C. Riley because, uh, <laughs> Ricky Ralph, you know what I mean? Like, oh. that was, uh, I'm gonna wreck it, you know? We can become best friends. Yep! <laughs> You want to go first? What was the makeup process right for the red, like for the red skull? Oh, I, it was actually really easy. Um, so, so a lot of people asked, you know, if it was really difficult because, of course, for Hugo, that took I think it took like three hours each time you had to do that that uh, facial prosthetic. But the nice thing is, with Josh Brolin, Mark Ruffalo, and myself, and whoever had um, augmented uh, faces or bodies. Um, it, it was a much easier process because they just do the dots. They take a, a, a basically not a sharpie, but kind of like that, and it, uh, they do quadrants all over your face. Um, I, I wish I could show you a picture. I got it from way well back, but like it's basically just dots all over your face, and then the head cam gets attached to your uh, uh, head like this, and that way they can just map out your face and add or remove whatever they need to. But it's still your, you know, facial expressions and everything. But it was actually once the dots are there, um, that's it. I mean, it was. I mean, the, 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 the CGI on those projects are just incredible. You know, I, I actually am in the camp. Like some people were wishing that Josh actually were wearing the uh, the, the makeup and everything. But I thought he looked great. I thought Hulk looked great. I mean, CGI has just come leaps and bounds even in the last like five, ten years. You know, so yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Favorite to do and why? Um, I, it's it's kind of a I'm gonna it's be very diplomatic with an answer because like Aaron is the, the role that saved me from being in the poorhouse. Like I mean I I had like six figures of debt and I was not doing so well emotionally and financially at that time. Um, so that that role definitely changed my life so much and. Um, I'm, I'm so grateful to play him for a lot of different reasons, but um, for me, the most meaningful, I think, was, was Red Skull, because as a kid, I used to spend all of my lawn mowing money um, and babysitting money on Marvel Comics and, and comic book cards, and so I had, I still have, my mom's going to throw them out, and I got very upset with 
Um, but they have, I have like Marvel series one through three, Marvel masterpieces, and, and just like those comic book cards um, were part of the reason why I wanted to become an artist. So I used to draw. Oh, there was an Omega Red walking around yesterday. I don't know if you guys saw him, but he was amazing. I wanted to talk to him, late, but I didn't get a chance. But um, I used to draw Omega Red. I used to draw Red Skull, Mephisto, Wolverine, Cyclops. Um, there was a bunch of characters that I just obsessed over drawing. So it was a weird thing to, you know, as a, as a nine, ten year old, draw a red skull and then just, you know, I had a thing with skulls apparently, like, you know, Ghost Rider. And uh, to one day then go from drawing these characters to then playing this guy, I mean, it just, it, it was such a mind blowing uh, moment when I got that call. It was, yeah, so that was probably the most meaningful, I'd say, yeah. That's amazing. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Hey, how's it going? Good. Hey, Thanks, Robin. Thanks, Robin. Hey, you're talking about Aaron uh, dying on the walk there. This is Sunday's episode. I'm kind of happy to share us out there at the beginning there. <laughs> oh, did you say if you wouldn't? This Sunday's episode. Oh, uh, yeah. Have you ever seen it? Yeah. Oh, don't say anything. I'm like, whoa. That'd be a little stressful film. It's, so. it, it, if you guys get a chance, I don't know what you're doing tonight. I know there's a lot of football and everything, but tonight's episode is awesome. Really it's good. really good. Really good. Yeah, but, uh, yeah my question was um, for characters like Aaron and So when I got Aaron, I talked to Scott Gamble, who was showrunning at the time, and I said, you know, do you want me to read all of the, the comics to get inspiration? And he said, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Roberts laid out this inc incredible blueprint for us, for all the characters. And he said, you know, beg, borrow, and steal as much as you want from that, but ultimately I want you to make it your own, so infuse as many ideas into it as you want. And that was, that was nice to have that freedom, but also have sort of a a basic blueprint for what the character should look like and, and feel like, I guess. Um, but, uh, yeah, what was the second part of your question? Like, with the moral and the oh, so yeah. you read those? So, I, I've, I've read the first compendium now, and uh, I, I, have you guys been watching Invisible? Yeah. You got cool. Yeah. That show is freaking awesome. Like, I, I had never really heard of it before I booked it. Um, which I'm ashamed to admit, like that's that's kind of crazy because Robert obviously wrote both of them. I'm like, oh man, I should, I should know what else he's done. You know? <laughs> but like, as soon as I booked it, I, I read all of those that the first companion. I was like, this is amazing, and it's so it, it, it's it's cool because um, it turns the superhero genre on its head, you know, and it, and it, like where where sometimes I think you know other superhero movies can be very formulaic and you know. Um, Kind of like you know what's going to happen. I love that Invincible turns everything on its head, and it's just like you don't know what's going to happen from week to week, you know. And that's why I, love, I think that's why I love Infinity War too, because you just you you saw the villain win, you know. And when does that ever happen? And it was such a I I, I know a lot of people were really upset at the end of Infinity War, but I was like, this is amazing. I mean, this the bad guy won, and it was I don't know, it was it was cool. Like I, I thought it was great, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Being an impressionist and such a talented one, but doing more niche voices you don't hear a lot of people do, like John C. Ryan, Ewan McGregor, what is it about a voice when you hear it that you are like, I could do that, and I think I could do that pretty well, or do you just, anything you hear that you're like, that's cool, and then you like, try to run it through your head? That's I, you know, I don't, the, the John C. Riley, uh, the first time I ever did John C. Riley was, was my oh, thanks <laughs> Thank you. That, that was kind of like pressure based. Um, I was I just done a Nickelodeon audition. This I don't know, this was like eight nine years ago I want to say, and um, more was it? But anyway, um, I just done this Nickelodeon audition, and I was driving home, and my manager said, "Oh, they want you to come right back. Uh, do you do a John C. Riley impression?" I was like, "I don't think so." It was ironically for Wreck It Ralph, the video game. I and uh, I don't know if John was not available or whatever, but they were like, we need someone who can voice match for him. And I was like, hung up on the phone, I was like, okay, I have John C. Riley, John C. Riley. I don't know how to do it. Oh, then that's kind of John C. Riley. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> and it just kind of came in that moment, but normally I have to really work on a, on a character for a while. Um, but like with you, it, it, you know what it is sometimes, like when you admire someone's work and you watch them often enough, it just like, I kind of want to, you, you, you 
just naturally sort of absorb their their uh, their voice or their character. Like I I never tried uh, Anthony Hopkins up until watching Westworld, and for some reason watching that over and over because I love that show and and hearing his voice and the, the way he talks and just the cadence and everything. After a while, I finally started talking like it just accidentally, and uh, sometimes it just happens. You never know. Yeah. But most of the time, I have to work on it quite a bit. Yeah. Yes, I love the Matt Damon man impression. Oh, the, the the restraining of a smile. Yeah. I don't I don't know how to speak like Matt Damon, but he's always just like constantly just like restraining a smile. He's like, that's it. That's all. That's all. That's it. Thank you, bud. Oh, you look great. So I was wondering if there's a particular role that you either like have or have that you found particularly hard to get into. Ooh. Um, so for for the immortal, for invincible, um, I I didn't know what Robert had in mind for that character because uh, you know he's this big you know tough guy, but I wanted to like make sure that it was it was exactly the voice that he was wanting, and we were kind of he was directing me kind of on the fly. And um, I hope this isn't a spoiler for anybody, but at, at one iteration of his life, he was Abraham Lincoln. And they show it like super quickly, you know, and it's like, you know, he's, he, I think he starts as like a Scottish Highland warrior, and then they flash forward a little bit, and he's another character, and then a, the next iteration of him is Abraham Lincoln. And uh, I had never heard Abraham Lincoln, aside from what I, you know, watched from uh, Daniel Day Lewis's Lincoln. But I didn't want it to sound quite like that. I wanted to put my own spin on it. So um, I think I researched some like Civil War documentaries, and there was some some people who had tried Lincoln impressions, and I kind of you know took little bits of that. Um, but it was interesting because in the in the moment when we were recording it, Robert was throwing suggestions on what he kind of wanted it to sound like, and uh, I was really nervous that I was going to like mess it up. But you, you ultimately he was quite happy with it. So. But, but yeah, sometimes you're just like coming up with these voices literally in the moment, like uh, Aquarius for that for first episode as well. I didn't know what the hell I was gonna do for it. I just I really had no idea for what that guy should sound like. I just knew he had a big giant mouth. And he's basically, his whole body is just a mouth, you know, essentially. And uh, I don't know who suggested this. It was maybe Robert, maybe someone else, but they were like, can you do like a like, Jeff Bridges for this, and they're like, oh, okay, uh, yeah, man, and they're like, yeah, like, like underwater Jeff Bridges, I'm like, oh, okay, so you saw him, but you know, you know, and uh, they're like, yeah, 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 that's, uh, so sometimes this stuff happens just like in the moment, and it just kind of, you know, it, it just kind of percolates, and, and people are just like throwing out ideas, and it just happens, so that's kind of a fun thing, and the scary thing about voice work is that more often than not, you're just coming up with these voices, and I understand. I mean, I can't say I've ever heard Abraham Lincoln either. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I've got time for one last question. Uh, were you ever afraid that agreeing to lose your hand would end up getting your character killed off, infection, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's always the, the fear on the show is that, like, usually if you lose a limb on the show, you don't last long after that. You know, that's a good point. Um, Merle, uh, of course, Herschel. Um, who else is lost? Quite a few, quite a few people lost limbs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, the governor, of course, lost them, but uh, not quite a limb, but yeah. Um, so I was more just concerned about how I was going to be able to do it by while keeping my arm immobile. But once they put on the prosthetic and they matched it to my actual, um, you know, dimensions and everything, they had me dip it in this like epoxy stuff, and uh, the, the, the process took quite a while. But it, but after it, it came out, I was like, this is awesome. So. Greg Nicotero and his team at KP is just like, they're the masters. I mean, they're the people that, you know, do this for every single big movie you've ever seen. It was, it was a trip, but yeah. Anyway, yeah, thank you. Well, thanks for coming out. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So what are you guys going to do today? You guys going to just walk around the floor and check out some stuff? Thank you. I do. Yeah. 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 Good see you. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Let's have a big round of applause.
They think order and chaos are somehow opposites and try to control what won't be. I used to fuck guys like that.